Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this Thrive Today free webinar entitled The Joy Switch. My name is Christy Harang, and I will be your host today. On behalf of the Thrive Today team, we are so glad to have you joining with us and just thank you for being a part of this webinar, webinar today. So we are being joined by our president and co-founder, Chris Corsi. We're gonna be having a conversation uh, with Chris on the release of his new book, The Joy Switch. That's kind of the topic that we're on today. And Chris is um, an incredible wealth of knowledge. For over 20 years, he's been studying and developing um, and practicing brain-based solutions to make our relationships work better. So Chris actually got his start in specializing in severe trauma and abuse, and then he pastored for several years, and now he serves as the president of Thrive Today, just developing uh, training for us in the relational skills that we're going to be talking about. And so he's also an author. He's written nine books, including Transforming Fellowship, Four Habits of Joy-Filled Marriages, which he co-wrote with Dr. Marcus Warner, and the book that is the inspiration of our conversation today, The Joy Switch. So Chris, thank you so much for being here. You wanted to say a quick hello? Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's so good to be here. I'm excited, my friends, for our time together today. I've been looking forward to this for weeks, so thank you for being here. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. So if you are newer to Thrive Today, I already mentioned it a little bit, but our focus is training people in the skills that we all need to thrive in life and to have healthy relationships. And our real passion is in equipping people in um, equipping people with the practices that we can all implement in our everyday lives to develop and strengthen these relational skills. And so today we're going to be focusing on the foundation upon which all of the other relational skills we talk about build. And so brain science has discovered that there's this switch in our brain, which we're calling the joy switch. And this actually turns on the relational part of our brain or what we at Thrive Today like to call our relational circuits or our relational engine. So when this joy switch is on, we actually have access to joy. We have access to healthy emotions. And in that place, we're able to build healthy relationships. Um, so in our time together, we're going to be talking about what this joy switch is, what it looks like when it's on versus when it's off. And then Chris is going to be sharing some principles for turning on the joy switch. And he's even going to get us activated today and turning our joy switch on by leading us through an exercise. So before we get into our questions, I just want to mention that we are going to have time for Q&A at the end. So as questions pop up into your mind, you can jot them down or put them in the Q&A button in Zoom. Um, and also, we are recording this, so if you want to pass this along to friends, you can send the registration link to them, and they will get a recording. So with that, I think we're going to dive in, Chris. All right. I'm looking forward to it. So, Chris, we're going to, um, in the introduction, I talked about these concepts, joy switch, relational circuits. We're going to get into those in a minute, but I want to back up and have you start by laying uh, or maybe setting the stage for us in why you're so passionate about these topics and why they actually matter in the first place. All right. Well, that's a great question. And honestly, um, one of the reasons I'm most excited about this is because I lived the first half of my life not having these skills. And when you live your life missing certain relational skills, it's just not fun. Um, problems become bigger than relationships, pain is loud. And when you don't know how to deal with that, you're just not a good version of yourself. So I can remember sitting in church every Sunday growing up and learning the Bible and hearing the Bible and something within me um, just went pretty much to hopeless despair every time I would hear about the kind of people we're supposed to be because I knew I was not that kind of a person in my thinking, in my behavior, in my character. And I didn't really understand the concept of being relational like the Good Shepherd, who is a relational God. And so, you know, as I got a little older, um, when I went into ministry, as Christy shared, I started out working with severe trauma. And it was quickly apparent how those skills were missing in my life when I tried to help and come alongside of people who were 
hurting and who are in a severe crisis and pain. So this was also the time that I came across Living from the Heart Jesus Gave You, and I met Dr. Jim Wilder. This was in the, uh, the 90s. And when I first learned from Jim how our brain is designed for joy, um, that resonated for me. It like, basically explained my life, and it explained what uh, I was seeing in those that I was serving in the recovery ministry. So it put me on this particular course of wanting to see people become the best version of themselves this side of heaven. How do we live joyfully? How, how do we hold on to joy um, when things go wrong? How do we return to joy? And so for the last 20 years, I've been running trainings, um, teaching, training people in the 19 relational skills. And they're all fascinating skills, but there's one um, particular skill called the master switch. And the master switch is really the foundation for all 19 skills. Like you have to get your master switch on and working. We'd also know it as the relational circuit. So we have to get that circuit on in order to learn any of those skills basically and hold on to joy, recover when things go wrong and even have a sense of God's presence and God's peace. It really came down to this particular switch in the brain. So I had a chance um, to write a book um, basically on this whole relational circuit, how to live relationally and how to stay in what I call in the book our, in our relational sweet spot. So that started, um, that basically opportunity came about this year. It was supposed to be next year, but um, the publisher had a, a two month window right when the coronavirus started and the quarantine uh, went into effect. I had this window to write this book. It was not an easy time of life for most of us, but uh, it actually provided a good opportunity for me to create the 19 exercises that are in this book and write a book about how to stay relational when things go wrong and how do we hold on to our joy. So that's what I was after, Christy, with this book. Just something simple, something that people could immediately put into practice um, as they read the book and it fits in your back pocket. So, hey, it's a win-win. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember, I remember having a conversation with you about this last spring, Chris, about how excited I was for the book. And, and this is what we're hearing from a lot of people that have been reading it, is that you take things that we all can relate to, relational experiences and, and struggles that we all have, and you put language to it. Uh, which makes it, it's just enlightening. Like, oh, that's so helpful to understand what's going on in my brain and, and to put some explanation to things that we all encounter. So can you help us by defining these terms? Joy switch, what is it? What does it do? Um, just talk to us about that. So the joy switch is very much like the light switch on your wall that you flip that switch and it turns the lights on. So for your brain, the joy switch is uh, very much the things that you do to turn on this relational circuit in your brain. So in the 1990s, um, a guy by the name of Alan Shore came out with these, um, this amazing research. He's called the Einstein of psychiatry. The guy just basically came, wrote these very thick books about all the brain research. And one of the things he discovered in this research was on the right side of our brain is a, what's called a hierarchical model. It's a, it's a control center. There's four parts to this control center. And they actually, um, it's hierarchical, which means if something's wrong in the lower parts of this control center, that's going to impact some other places in your brain, um, which was actually kind of a novel concept for a lot of scientists because a lot of scientists just say, hey, you've got something wrong over here in your brain. Let's look at that with no consideration that possibly that's also impacting other places. So in this control center, um, we found that, that it very much is like your car engine. It works together when things are good, when things break down. Basically, when you can no longer manage what you feel, um, that breaks down and so the work of Jim Wilder and Carl Lehman, um, they really have gone into a lot of detail in that research. Whereas I basically, I'm, I'm someone that likes to take this, this brain science and the theory and make it practical. So 
I took the concepts and said, okay, so when I go home tonight and I interact with my family, how is this all relevant to my interactions with my family or with my friends? And how is this really, um, as a minister as well, obviously, how is this relevant to my relationship with God? So the Joy Switch book basically unpacks that we have this relational engine, this relational circuit, which is very much like, um, you know, it's, it's, it is like a switch, whereas it can go on or off. It's very much like a circuit breaker. Uh, Carl Lehman would describe it as like a circuit breaker. And you know what, when it's on, you are the best version of yourself. You have access to your, your, your relational tools that you use in life. But when it goes down, you go into basically an offline mode. In the book, I call it airplane mode. There's not a lot of sending or receiving, not a lot of updating, uh, just like your phone was in airplane mode. Um, Jim Wilder would call it enemy mode. So that's a good term because the people you normally enjoy feel more like enemies. And so the question is, we all experience this. Every human being on this planet with a working brain um, you know, ha has this happen where you're in a good place and then all of a sudden you're in a non-relational place. And how do you shorten the time you're in the non-relational place? So in the book, you know, I, I basically unpack what, what can the joy switch look like? And I use a lot of different words we'll talk about today to, uh, you know, what do you need when you go into enemy mode? And all of us have different things that help or different things that hurt. Usually we know what doesn't work, right? So if you're offline, you know what doesn't help pretty quickly when you interact with other people. Maybe they're trying to help, but they're just saying the wrong things or they're minimizing your pain, which actually makes the upset worse. So this is just a reality for all of us. The question is, how do we learn the skills, the habits to stay in our relational sweet spot? So yeah, that's what we're after here today, Christy. That's great. So as you talk about, um, you know, when it's on, we can be the best version of ourselves. You're giving a little bit of examples. Can you paint the picture for us of what it might look like when it's on or when it's off? Um, some things that can kind of start getting our antennas going up to see, oh yeah, when I do that, okay, that's a sign that my relational brain is not working properly. Yes, you know, for me, a practical example, this happens regularly in my family. Um, when my sons come home from school, they're excited, right? It's been a great day at school, playing with their friends, interacting with their teachers. They come home just full of energy, full of joy. And I notice a very distinct difference when I'm in relational mode or when I'm, my brain's in enemy mode. So when I'm in relational mode, I hear the sound of that chitter chatter and I hear them throwing down their book bags and they're hungry for a snack. And I have this desire, this just joyful response in me, like, oh, the kids are home, I wanna see them and I wanna interact with them. So it's just this genuine joyful response kind of bubbles up within me. And I just can't wait to see them and interact with them. So I'm looking forward to and I'm anticipating joy so my relational brain is on and ready for interaction. There's other times where maybe it's fatigue, back pain, or stress, or anxiety, or whatever it is, but there's times where my brain is not in that relational mode, that sweet spot, and I'm in enemy mode. And maybe I'm focusing on a project really intensely, and I'm under pressure. When I hear the, um, the arrival of my, my family, I don't feel joy right? Joy is just not there. I'm thinking, uh oh, the boys are home. It's going to be loud. I've got to, you know, I've got to do this interview. I've got to write this paper or whatever it is. I actually have the opposite response of joy, which is really not a good expression of my heart because I genuinely enjoy my family. But in enemy mode, something else, usually it's a task has become, or a problem has become more important. And when I'm in enemy mode, I I just want to make um, a problem person or feeling go away. Like, you know, oh, if the boys would just be quiet for a while so I can focus and hopefully they won't, you know, storm into my office really loudly and, um, you know, interrupt what I'm doing. So it's just, you know, that you, you feel anything but joy when you're in enemy mode. 
Um, some of us, you know, get a high energy re reaction where we're mad or we're more frantic or anxious about something. So we're in this high energy state. Some of us um, kind of shut down. So you just kind of disconnect or you freeze. And for me, I, I can recognize both. So if I'm anxious about something, my heart rate's increased and I, my focus is a little more sharper on whatever I'm doing, but it's task oriented. It's not relational or relationship oriented. Now the goal is even if you've got work to do, you want your relational circuit to be on regardless because you have access to all your relational wisdom and you have a sense of history and you have the ability to predict things going forward. You, you have access to your relational skills. So when you're in enemy mode, you're just not only not relational, um, you are hindered from being the best version of yourself. And that's where things go wrong. And it's when we're stuck in enemy mode that we problems become bigger. And instead of spreading the good stuff, we actually spread negativity and some of the bad stuff. So it's just not pretty. Um, so that for me is a very realistic, practical example. And I can feel it in my body. I can notice it in my thoughts. I can, you know, really be in tune with, wow, I'm in enemy mode. I better get back to relational mode because I, I want to have a joyful response when I see my family or if I run into a friend um, and maybe there's some tension there. I still want to be glad to be with my friend. That's just, that's kind of who God created us to be that even though, you know, pain and problems happen, we still have a God who is glad to be with us, who is with us. And the goal is how do we still reflect God's nature, character, and love in this world? Because when we're stuck in enemy mode, it's safe to say that's not going to happen. So, so it almost sounds like, and you can cor correct me, but there's this differentiation between having an openness to connect relationally to people versus kind of just being a little bit shut down relationally. Totally. You know, you can, with a little bit of practice on this, on this skill, like you, you can learn to notice when you're fading. So um, I use the example of a light switch for this um, relational cir circuit. It's actually more like a dimmer switch. And I go into that a little more in the book. But it's like you can feel yourself fading. And all of you who are with us today or watching on video, you know you've had those times where maybe things were going good. And then all of a sudden something starts to happen. Your day changes, interactions occur, which were not joyful. And suddenly you can feel yourself fading. You're losing your relational footing, we might say. You're slipping into enemy mode. And at that point, your brain is going to focus on a problem. It's going to focus on a pain. And it's going to be hard to quiet what you're feeling. So in enemy mode, everything is bigger, it's louder, and it's more unmanageable. And so in the book, I, I give a lot of very practical examples of when I've been in enemy mode um, or when I've encountered uh, friends or loved ones who are in enemy mode and just how that looks and how that feels. And with a little bit of thought and practice, we can all relate to this because it happens every day. As long as you have a human brain, you interact with other human beings, this is going to be relevant. And, you know, we can see this for the um, biblical astute among us here. We can also see this in the Bible. You can see times where people are doing good in some places and other, other places, a problem becomes bigger. Like, you know, I think of Peter immediately where Jesus is kind of unpacking what's going to happen in, in, the near future and how he's going to be leaving them and he's preparing them and he assures them you're all going to deny me and it's just going to happen so i'm telling you now you're going to deny me and peter bless him you know he's like oh no now, these guys might but not this guy i'm not going to deny you because you know what i i'm with you till the end and jesus knew you know peter you've got the desire but you don't have the capacity buddy so you've got the desire and the motivation to be with me through thick and thin, but you know what? You don't have the capacity or the bandwidth. So in fact, you are going to deny me. Um, and I, I love that example because I can relate to that. And I bet many of us can relate to that. Like we have the desire, we have the, the willpower, but there's some other force that's just not there. We don't have the bandwidth, the maturity or the capacity to be able to stay our relational selves. 
So what happens is fear takes over. And when fear takes over, that's what happens in enemy mode. So now problems become more unmanageable and we're just not a good version of ourselves. And so I really wrote this book for people to have the language because this happens. This often happens throughout a day, throughout a week. This happens with a lot of interactions that we have. And also, how do we learn the tools? How do we develop the skills? How do we create those habits so that I can recognize, wow, I'm slipping here and I need to get back into relational mode like quickly. And it's in relational mode, you know, when we think about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, like that fruit of the spirit shows up in relational mode, right? We are in our relational sweet spot. So we have this working brain, but it's even, you know, God's spirit is like, has to interact with us and how we see here, understand what we notice is really dependent upon how well this brain that God has given me is working. And we would say it's more as how, how well is it trained? And that's the good news here, Christy, like we can all, we can improve no matter where you are today, friends. A little bit of practice goes a long way, and joy is truly a, a game changer for all of us. Wow, that's so good. Um, I was thinking about, too, Chris, how it, it, having the joy switch off can be so subtle, because I, I'm thinking of times when I'm maybe having a conversation with my husband, and he's sharing things, and I'm saying all the right things, and I'm listening. My left brain's there. I can verbatim say everything he shared with me but yet my heart like I'm not engaged emotionally you know I'm not actually caring about what he's saying I'm not actually like making eye contact and connecting with him I'm just like a almost like a computer just registering what he's saying mm -hmm. and so in that case like my my relational circuits aren't on my joy switch isn't on but I might look like it from the outside you know yeah. Oh, totally. Yo, that's the tricky thing, honestly, is like, I can look like my relational circuits are on, but mo a lot of the time I'm just going through the motions. So maybe in my mind, I'm distracted by something else. While, as you said, with a great example here, while we even interact with someone we love, we can be internally distracted. Um, and you know what? It just robs us of joy and peace in the moment. And your brain's an amplifier. So it's either going to grow something good in the moment or it's going to grow something bad, but it's going to grow something. It's just what's the quality and what's being grown. So learning to be relational really does help us. Um, in many ways, it's, it's like a break. So I might recognize I'm getting defensive while I interact with my wife, or I might recognize my feelings are getting hurt while I'm interacting with a friend. Oh, uh, who's not glad to be with me. When I'm still relational, I can correct course. So I can have thoughts that go, wow, I don't want to say that because that will make this worse. I think I better say this instead, or I better talk with Emmanuel a little bit and get some peace before I continue. Like when your relational circuits are on, you can correct course and make adjustments so that that relationship stays bigger than the pain or the problem. But when you're in enemy mode, the brakes are out, the filters busted temporarily. So that's when we tend to say things without thinking them through. And then we've got more relational casualties because we just said the very thing, you know, we wish we could take back. And I'm sure many of us can relate to that. I know I have inserted my feet into my mouth on several occasions when my relational circuit is off. So it's just so much better when we're in relational mode. Yeah, I'm sure none of us can relate to that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't ever like lose never our happens. filter. And <laughs> yeah, never happens. So Chris, let's talk about, about the ability to regulate our joy switch because um, we've heard it said a lot, like there's left brain people and right brain people. And this, this idea that, okay, well, you're just wired to be relational. So when it comes to activating our joy switch, turning it on and off, is that something that's just accessible to right brain wired people? Can you talk to us about that concept mm -hmm. and how we're, um, how we are wired to 
activate or regulate our joy switch? Yeah, this is a this is a very good question. Um, you know, the goal for all of us, whether we're introvert, extrovert, relational, or task driven, task oriented, here's the good news: like getting your relational circuit on, even if you don't like interacting with people getting your relational circuit on still helps you be a better version of yourself. So it still helps you to, to use wisdom in a given moment. It still helps you to predict a negative outcome. So there's actually many brain abilities that are there when your relational circuit's on. Basically, the relational circuit keeps us, keeps us connected with the right frontal lobe, which is like, you know, the part of the brain that we really know as ourselves and the skill we call it is acting like our relational selves. So those abilities are present. Most of the time when people are thinking, you know, this relate people, I don't like people or relationships aren't just for, aren't for me. We're usually, or someone's more relational, we're usually thinking of attachment styles. And so attachment styles is a completely, it's part that attachment circuit is actually part of the relational circuit, but attachment styles, they're in place by the time we're even just several months old. So the patterns are are in place very early in life and some of us you know tend to be more outgoing more um just love people we love interacting with people some of us might have a little more dismissive um response where we just we just avoid people because we'd rather be on our phone computer or whatever it is whatever project um that might be so here's here's the good news no matter what you will be a better version of yourself when your relational circuits are on and you will have whatever relational skills you've learned up to this point those will be accessible and you can you're more likely to have an awareness of god's peace and god's presence when you're in relational mode when you're in enemy mode um you, it's like trying to see with your eyes closed it just doesn't go well relationally so i encourage people no matter whether you consider yourself introvert, extrovert, whether you're outgoing, whether you enjoy people, whether you don't, no matter where you are on that kind of spectrum, the good news is getting your relational circuits on will still help you be a better version of yourself. And that means you will be able to hold on to peace and you'll be able to hold on to joy. So it benefits you. It also benefits those that you interact with. And for those of us um, who you know are, are believers, then it, it also gives you the um, more awareness of having God's presence and God's peace with you moment by moment. So it really is a win-win across the board, no matter where people are on the spectrum. You are going to like the results of your life better and your interactions better when that relational circuit is on. And frankly, you just feel better. So it's good for you. And it's good for your family. It's good for your community. It's good for your interactions with the world. You're just going to be a better version of yourself. So is it fair to say, Chris, that we all are wired with the ability to regulate this joy switch that we have? Yes, that's good news. You know, especially with all that our country's navigating right now, like this is really good news. Like no matter where you are, no matter your beliefs, um, your political preferences, no matter what, being staying in relational mode will help you better navigate the terrain of your life, your family, your interactions, your faith, your spirituality. It, it is a win-win, my friends, and it's and this is possible. Like when I first learned this material myself, I needed a lot of work, I needed a lot of practice. And then what tends to happen when people start to practice is both they and other people around them notice like, wow, I noticed you reacted differently when that printer stopped working. Like normally that really pushes your buttons and you, you call it a few names, but I noticed this time, like you stayed relational and you handled it better. So people see it and feel it. But what's pretty exciting is we see it and feel it. like, wow, I handled that better than I normally would have. I become more patient, uh, more self-controlled. I'm, I'm more hopeful. I feel lighter. I feel more joyful. I've heard people describe it as they start to see colors in a whole new way. They start to notice the birds singing in a whole new way. 
Um, they start enjoying people in their lives in a whole new way. Like when we live relationally as God designed us to be, right? Because this is actually his design. When we live with our brain working the way that he designed it to, it's amazing. And honestly, I never knew this kind of living was possible until I started learning these skills and, and living relationally. Like, I didn't know life could be this amazing, joyful, peaceful, just because I lacked it growing up, but I didn't have a language or the tools, right? So that's the key here. Um, that's why really I'm excited about this book because you can practice those exercises. You can make them habits. It, it will um, change how you feel, how you think, how you interact so that you are that better version of yourself and more like Christ. And that to me is really good news. Like that's, that reality is possible, but just take some practice. Like a lot of character traits, character skills. We just, we need a little bit of practice and that will go a long way. No, it's so good. It does bring so much hope to know that we're not stuck where we're at, but there is that potential to grow and to mature and develop. And, um, and it's very, actually very simple. So uh, you started diving into it a little bit, but talk to us about what is the key component to actually being able to turn on our joy switch? Yeah, so in the book, I call it cars. So that joy switch, again, it can be a lot of different things. Some people, they feel better going for a walk outside in the fresh air. Some people feel better interacting with their pet. Um, so the goal in the book is through some of the exercises is I just help you kind of discover what are the things that help you, um, what is the joy switch options that work well for you. So for example, I've learned with my wife, um, her relational circuit will come on rather well when she spends time with friends or when we interact. Like just if it's been a hard day and she's feeling it, if we sit down and simply connect, and that's the first C in CARS, C-A-R-S. So the first C is connect. And when you connect with others, the goal is to feel seen and understood, not minimized, not dismissed, but just seen and understood. So if Jen's had a bad day, I say, wow, this sounds like a bad day. So validation is say what you see and what you hear so that she will feel understood, valued, um, seen and heard, right? That's the goal with connecting. So we might connect with a friend over tea or over coffee or on the phone or with a spouse. We just, we just connect. And it's the people who help us feel um, validated and comforted, right? Because some people you're going to connect with, they're going to make the problem bigger. They're going to tell you why you should be more upset. And that is the most unhelpful thing. You know, they're usually well-intentioned, but they just don't have the skill or maybe they're in enemy mode. So connecting and then the A in cars is appreciation. So you're gonna get the most bang for your buck as far as your relational brain's concerned by remembering the good stuff. So just thinking about remembering the good stuff. When you pull up a file, maybe it was, you know, this really fun interaction I had with my sons yesterday. Uh, we were laughing and playing around, just thinking about some of that joy your brain responds as though you're reliving the moment all over again. So my brain opens up that file and all the good chemicals that are released from that memory, both when it happened, is now those chemicals are being released again just by thinking about it, noticing it, and feeling it. So appreciation is just remembering the good stuff. Gratitude is just you know what we're thankful for. Appreciation is just remembering, I call it package joy, right? Just remembering and unwrapping these joy moments that we've had. And then um, joy is a high energy emotion. So we can only usually sustain a, a joy for a very short amount of time before we need a breather. So toddlers will, um, babies will do this after, you know, after three months, about that time, they will look away from you when they've had enough interaction in a moment. It's called, you know, gaze avert. They'll avert their gaze. That just says, hey, I love what's happening here, but I need a breather. So we can only have so much joy before we need a relational rest. So that's just that rest is the, is the R in cars where we just pause, we catch our breath and we recharge our battery so that we can then shift back into the high energy joy. So it's joy and rest. There's a rhythm here. 
And so having a chance to quiet, ah, taking that deep breath and just pausing, coming up for air, that then gives us more bandwidth and strength for the uh, interactive joy. So rest is just take a moment to quiet and you can still quiet with other people. It's just a pause. Um, or you can go excuse yourself and just go and have a moment of, of quiet or silence where you can catch your breath. And then the S is the shalom my body. And those are actually a very specific set of exercises um, I've gotten from Jim Wilder and Carl Lehman, uh, who basically, you know, their exercise designed to stimulate your vagal nerve, which we're now learning the vagal nerve is a nerve from the base of your brain that runs throughout all your major organs. And stimulating the vagal nerve um, actually helps to kind of wake up your relational brain. So on, on my YouTube channel at Chris Corsi thrive, or just look for thrive today, I demonstrate what the Shalom my body exercises look like with the joy switch uh, material. We've got Jim Wilder also demonstrates uh, the exercises as well. So they're just specific exercises. Um, one of them is yawning and yawning is actually really good for you, which we don't think about, but yawning helps your body quiet and yawning actually releases feel good chemicals. So it's peaceful. We think it's socially unacceptable to yawn. It's like, oh, it's rude, but actually yawning's good. So I tell teachers, let your students yawn. They'll actually be good for their brain. Like Olympic athletes will yawn before a race. It's like preparing them. So yawning is good. So that's actually part of the Shalom My Body exercises, but there's several that you can learn. And basically what it does is it kind of jumpstarts your relational battery. Um, but as I said, Christy, some people, they just might want to right? Go in nature, just going outside and being in the fresh air can also help people just feel grounded again. And that's what mm, that's good. And, and what I love about in the joy switch book is you've got exercises and ideas at the end of the chapters that people can implement. And, and that's the point that we want to drive in is that we all have the capacity to regulate our joy switch to grow and develop in our relational skills, but it doesn't just like magically happen. We actually have to intentionally practice it. And so uh, different exercises or practices might work better for one person than another, but we find what works for us. And then we intentionally weave those practices into our daily lives so that we can grow and develop these things. And that's a game changer, Christy, like for all of our friends, you know, who are here or who are watching this video, like just some simple practices can go a long way and truly transform your life. Even since the book's been out for a week, the number of testimonies that have come in has just been remarkable. Like people who are practicing those exercises and they go, wow, this stuff really works. And their spouse is thanking me because of the difference or their, you know, their friends or, or whatever. I'm just getting these notes where people are practicing it and they're seeing the difference. And the proof is in the pudding. Like at the end of the day, hey, don't take my word for it if you don't want to. Go ahead and practice it yourself. You notice what happens. And when these things work, your brain will want to do them again because it works. You feel better. And you know what? We just waste so much energy when we're in enemy mode. Like it just pulls so much from our battery. So your brain actually will want to do these again because it helps you feel better, conserves energy, and it just brings you joy. So... It is a win-win. Fabulous. Well, I think you have an exercise that you can lead us through just to give people a taste of that. I do. You know what? I There's a lot. There's 19 exercises, so it's always hard for me to, to pick one. But I picked one from Chapter 4. And the exercise, it's Exercise 10. It's Unwrap Package Joy. So I mentioned appreciation as Package Joy. So the goal here is, the point I make in the book is a sequence where you want to think about the good stuff you feel it and then you share it. So you think about it, you feel it, you share it. That sequence is really what helps your brain to develop these habits, these relational habits. So the first thing I have you, I have people do, and you can just write this down. You can even type it into your phone. Just think about um, some of your favorite memories involving, first we'll start with people. So think about a time that was very meaningful, joyful, special for you when you had some time with the people that you love. So think about just one of those. We'll, we'll just focus on for now. Just think about one of those times. I think about a vacation I took with my family. 
last year and just how meaningful it was to have this time with my family. It was just so joyful and special. And just thinking about that memory, that connection actually just, I can already feel my body just relax. So as you think about that moment, you know, just notice how you feel as you kind of open that joy file, we might say. So that's the first one, people. And then the next one would be a place. So it's places. So this is where you go somewhere special. So think about just a, a special memory of going to a place that was special. For, for me, uh, my family lives in Holland, Michigan. So you know what? There's a beautiful beach right down the road from where we live. And one of our favorite things to do is just to go to the beach and walk, walk along the beach and watch the sunset. So I think about that going to that place with people I enjoy. And I just, again, you just notice you feel calmer. You feel a little more settled, peaceful. Well, as you just take a moment and think about that, you know, what's a special place for you? And the key is notice how you feel. How do you feel when you think about that place? And in the exercise, I normally will have people just write down a name for each one, like a word. So mine might be beach. And when I think about that word beach, it reminds me of this joyful, peaceful moment, going to a place that's very meaningful for me. And then the next step would be food, right? Food can be a source of joy, especially when it's food shared with people we love. So for that, I would just have you think about, you know, eating something you enjoy, just a special moment, having a meal, with people that you enjoy. So I think about a meal I had when my friends and I were writing the book, Joy Starts Here. We were in a cabin in Montana, sitting, having a meal together. And the food was amazing, but being with people that I value and enjoy just made that even more special. So think about eating something that you enjoy, particularly um, it's a shared moment. Might, maybe it's a, fan, a favorite restaurant. You went out on a date night or went out with some friends for pizza. Give that a word, name. Notice how that feels. And then next is animals, right? We love animals. Many of us have dogs or cats or birds or fish or whatever it is that you have. Just a chance where you interacted with an animal it might be a favorite pet that you had growing up or just an animal you enjoy. Some of us, some of my friends love horses, so they go visit horses at some of the horse farms. And my, we have a new pet this year, a little dog named Bella. So I would think about, we got Bella the night of the quarantine, right before the quarantine went into effect. We drove up north and grabbed, and bought this dog, so Bella. So I would just think about the joy of this, uh, this pet and just how much I've enjoyed having Bella. In our, in our house, in our family. So you think about your favorite pet or an animal that you enjoy, and this may be a moment where you could share that. Notice how that feels. And you know, when I say that, I want, it means notice your body. How's your breathing? How's your shoulders? How's your back, your stomach? Like you're just scanning your body. How does it feel when I remember the good stuff here? And then what I would do is, um, you know, take time for you to pay attention. Do you feel more relational? Like for me, I notice I immediately feel more peaceful. I feel some comfort. I feel relaxed. I feel a little more present. I just notice just pausing to do the exercise there. Very simple, short exercise. I already feel um, just more relaxed and calm. And that's what we're after. So I feel more relational in this particular moment. And then what I would have people do in the book is then to look at, you know, are you more relational? And I have some checklists in the book that you can use. Um, and then if you want to really take this to another level, one of the things you can do is share with another person, a friend, um, just share some of what you were remembering and thinking about. And when you share that as a story, what brain scientists have found that even hearing a story lights up parts of the brain that are lit up in your brain while you think about experiencing it. So the listener's brain responds as though they've experienced that too, if you make it a good story. So those good stories are what we call four plus stories. So you use enough words 
I'm giving eye contact, I'm describing what's happening in my body, I'm, I'm using feeling words. And so even our listeners are responding as though they, they experience that. So you're spreading the good stuff. Joy is contagious. And when you share your stories, you're sharing joy. And that's what we're after here, Christy, is for all of us to feel the good stuff and then pass it on and just uh, yeah, notice what happens when you share those stories. Mm, thank you, Chris. So good. I know I have really enjoyed just taking time to focus on, on a, memories of appreciation. And sometimes we even um, focus on the negative, but then when we start intentionally searching through our files yes. for the good ones, then we actually start remembering more and more and more. And um, it's just a really delightful experience. You know, it is. The good memories. It is. And, and for some of us, we might find like, if your brain's not used to this, what will happen is your brain will get distracted with tasks, with your to-do list, with problems, with things waiting on. And that's okay. You know what? That's part of the process. And so it's, it, the encouragement is to keep going back to your peace. Go back to that moment, that memory. Lean into it. Share it. And over time, you will be able to, your brain can can stay with the joy even longer without kind of diverting down old paths, we might say. So it li uh -huh. this literally does change our brains. Like you could scan people's brains before they do this stuff and after, and over time you can actually see those changes. It's pretty remarkable. We are fearfully and wonderfully made as the Bible says. And that is so true. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we have got some questions that are starting to roll in, and we're going to get to those in just a minute. Again, if you have questions, type them into our Q&A feature on Zoom, and we just want to share a couple resources we have for you and some next steps. So I'm going to put the links right now um, before I forget, but I'm going to show you guys a couple slides. First of all, um, I really encourage you all, if you've not yet taken it, we have a joy assessment. Um, that you can take on our website. And here's the link. The link is also in the chat box and I'm also gonna email you the link. Uh, but if you're like, I don't know, I'm kind of curious how my joy levels are, you can take your relational temperature and this will just have some questions and a little assessment so you can get a feel for where you're at. And anything else you wanna say on the joy assessment, Chris? You know what, um, I just took the assessment the other day and I just had a ball. Like it, it was really fun. Um, people can, yeah, they can see me actually going through the assessment when they go, go to the webpage. Uh, it was really cool. Christy, I was just, you know, I was encouraged by some of the growth in some new areas, but I also discovered some other areas that needed more growth and attention. So it was a, it was a really interesting to go through that. Very hopeful. Oh, great. I'm going to do it again. I did it a while ago, but maybe I'll go back through it myself. Yeah, it's fun to see the difference. Yeah. So we have been referencing Chris's book, The Joy Switch, and you, if you have not read it yet, grab your copy. You can go to our website, um, you go to resources, and then the drop-down tab is books, but there's also the direct link here. So I, I highly recommend you check this out. You can see it's a, it's a very easy read. Chris gives so many examples. The chapters are relatively short. They have exercises at the end of them. So this is just a fabulous resource. And it's something you can also share with other people. You can implement with your family members and friends, the exercises that are in here. So highly recommend checking that out. And then we are gonna go deeper into this concept. So we were just skimming the surface today to give you an introduction into these concepts. But on January 30th, Chris is going to be going more into the theory behind what's, what's going on in your brain with the joy switch, with our relational circuits. And he's also going to have an exercise with each of our three sessions. So this will intermix theory with practice. So check that out. So you can go to our website and register at thrivetoday.org um, forward slash understanding your joy, joy switch event forward slash. We would love to have you join us for that. And I also just want to mention because it's happening today, Chris is going to be on In the Market with Janet Parshall. Am I saying her name right? Yeah, yeah okay. Janet Parshall. You got it. Um, so 
Anyway, so he's going to be live 5 p.m. Eastern time. So there's a link to her web page, and you can go live from there if you want to hear uh, Chris share more about his book with Janet. And just a couple last things I, I do want to mention is that um, on the 26th, I believe, Uversion is going to have a free reading plan for the Joy Switch. So if you're on Uversion, you can check that out. And we're going to have a course where Chris goes more into just practice for our joy switch. So he's going to have lots and lots of exercises and that'll be available in February. So just keep your eyes out or your ears open to that. And then finally, we'll have another short free webinar next month um, where we're talking about, can I have joy when I don't feel happy? <laughs> so we'll be diving more into the concept of joy. So with that, we've got some questions, Chris. Mm -hmm. So let me, so Great question. Can someone with a dismissive attachment overcome the preference for tasks or non-engagement? I don't think my husband gets the joy of deep connection with others, like only having hot dogs in life and never experiencing steak or ice cream, not knowing what he's missing. Yeah. So the thing about dismissive attachment is those of us who um, have some dismissiveness in our attachment style, basically we've learned to turn the volume down emotionally and relationally. So, and we usually tend to get overwhelmed with joy. Like, you know, we just might find it feels safer to be on my computer and not interacting with my family or on my phone or whatever. I was very dismissive when I first started this journey myself. So I know from experience on these things, um, but with dismissive, you know what? Small steps go a long way. So the way that we help people with dismissive styles is you know, helping them to notice wh what was satisfying from an interaction. What did they enjoy? How did they feel? And just gently like, okay, you know, just describe to me what you're feeling as you remember that. And so they just need a little bit of help to kind of turn the volume up. Um, and just, you know, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What's happening in my body? Those kinds of um, discussions can actually help to turn the volume up. Uh, but it just, it takes some time because we can easily get overwhelmed, um, especially for those of us who might have a more distracted attachment. So we just want more, 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 more. And the dismissive is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so just, you know, small steps go a long way. And just if you go out for a date night, if you have a walk in the neighborhood, just talk about, hey, how are you feeling? What do you notice as we're walking um, look at, can you see those birds over there? You hear them singing, like what, what happens in you when you hear that? We just have to learn to live in our bodies a little bit, particularly if we're dismissive. Um, but over time, that volume button gets turned up and then we're much more aware, we're much more secure and we can hold on to our joy and our peace better. So that, that is good news. It just takes a little bit of practice. Mm, that's really good news. Thank you, Chris. Uh, another great question and with a comment. So this um, individual is just saying, I really appreciate Chris so much. Met him at Thrive in 2016, thanking Jesus for his wisdom and compassionate heart. And she was asking, living from the heart talks about the effect in community, and that involves school, how to introduce Christian concepts to a community when different religions would not be pleased and pushed back. I want to impact this community that was founded by Christians in the 1800s with deep faith, who dedicated this entire area to God and his way. You know, there's a couple different roads up this mountain. Um, one way is to just help introduce relational skills, like you can just say, you know, here's how the brain works. And like, if you, relational skills are a breadcrumb trail that lead to God. I mean, basically these things are anchored in who God created us to be anchored in scripture. So you can start at least with this common language of, you know, here's what relational skills are. And no matter your faith or your belief, the human brain needs to learn these skills. However, as Christians, we just come from the perspective of actually God made us this way and the creator made us this way. And so being who he created us to be means that these things will be present because they reflect him. Um, but you can start where people are. You start where people are at uh, and usually just starting with joy and peace and some of those foundational relational skills will go a long way. And we've introduced this to a lot of groups that aren't necessarily, they don't subscribe to the Christian faith, 
even the interacting with God. And we've had a lot of success basically because when people are in the relational sweet spot and they practice, if they're motivated enough, they'll actually practice this stuff. And we've had a lot of people who have come to know Christ who didn't previously just because they were learning to stay relational and they practice some of the, um, the God skills, as we would call it, skill 13, which is God sight. And much to their surprise, Jesus was there and Jesus was interacting with them. So the, the, the skies are just endless on what can be done here with a little bit of creativity. My last thought would be just interact with Emmanuel about it and ask him as well, what kinds of things would he encourage you to implement and to start? What would he like to share about that? Maybe he has some creativity that will help you as well. So we do this in partnership with Emmanuel. And I think you're going to find that that's, that's a road of peace there. It's a good place to be. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll, we'll try to get to a few more. Um, this is a great one. Can you share some thoughts about how to feel anger without stuffing it, but remaining relational? Yeah. If I stuff anger, there's a good reason for it. Right. So it helps to understand, like, if I do this, my brain has learned to do this for whatever reason that is. So be tender. we want to be tender with our weaknesses when we start this process. Being hard on yourself will just keep you in enemy mode. So um, what I would encourage you to do is learn the, um, learn the cars, to use the car steps and the joy switch. Use those exercises. And what will happen is you experience more peace, you live in peace. And then when you lose your peace, when anger comes, what you'll find over time is you can actually start handling some of those feelings without disconnecting or stuffing. But when your brain goes into enemy mode, that's where the anger is really more unmanageable. So I would encourage you to practice feeling some of that anger, some of that frustration while you try to stay in relational mode, get, even giving yourself permission to feel that. If you have a friend who's really good at anger, like we... We usually know friends who are really good at anger, maybe some who aren't. So pick one who is, and just when you see them get angry, flustered, frustrated, and they handle it in a way they're like, wow, that's actually really impressive. Have them tell you stories of, of how they think and feel and what happens in them when they felt um, angry. And even that example will help your brain go, oh, that's, that's how that works. You know, and I could do that. So learn to stay in your sweet spot relationally and also get some examples and some stories from other people. And what that will do is that'll give your brain some really good practice and modeling. Mm, that's good. And that was, a, anger was a really big one for me. And one of the things I've shared that was a game changer was part of the process of feeling it was also acknowledging it. And I would just verbalize it. And I would say, I feel so angry right now. Like, I kind of just want to like hit the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that when I would even just express and validate what I was feeling, it would help That's diffuse great. it a bit. Yeah, I love that. It's so practical. And that, yeah. that's the message for all of us today. This is a great one. Uh, when you were doing the memories, Chris, the memories of pets, this individual started to cry because their pets have died. So what do you do when your good memories lead you to a sad one? Yeah, so this is a really good question. One is we still, we're tender with ourselves. So it's actually okay. Like it's it's like you to feel that. And so I wouldn't try to shut that down. I wouldn't try to dismiss it. Actually let yourself feel that because there's joy around the corner from sadness when we actually let ourselves feel it and even share it and have other people maybe who can still be glad to be with us in the midst of that. Um, and then what I would do, once you're able to feel it and quiet, then I would say, well, what, what, did, what else did you like about your pet? Like what other fun memories come up? And so the sadness might be there, but what you're teaching your brain is I can feel these feelings, but I can also hold on to joy. So we're not going to dismiss the, the emotion. Let yourself be sad. You're sad for a good reason. It's like you to care and to love your pet. That's actually a good express, expression of who God made you to be. Just feel it, quiet it, share it if you can with a friend, quiet it. And then I would also keep finding ways like, okay, Lord, is there something else you want me to enjoy about this pet? Because maybe God might even have a few thoughts to share with you about why he gave you that pet in the first place and just some other fun moments or memories 
with your pet. So, but that, that's a really good question. Awesome. Well, we're going to take one last question. I just want to mention, um, if we didn't get to your question and you were asking about resources or next steps, please p feel free to um, email us at info at thrivetoday.org because we would really like to help you figure out what's the best resource for your situation or what you're looking at. Um, but this question is, in your book, you make the statement, peace comes when we know we're not alone with our feelings and that how we feel, sorry, my, um, and peace comes when we know we're not alone with our feelings and that how we feel makes sense for the situation we face. Can you talk more about this? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a reference. I, I think I mentioned that, I actually quote Jim Wilder on that one. Um, yeah, the goal is learning to hold on to peace, right? Peace can be fleeting in our world. And when you're in enemy mode, you're gonna find a painful absence of peace. So the goal here is, what are the things that infuse peace into your mind and your body? So joy should always lead to peace. So when we feel joy, we experience joy, we're also trying, that's why we're also trying to pay attention to our bodies. Like what, what was good from your day, but what was also peaceful from your day? So these are exercises I do with my, with my family, usually around the dinner table. We will do highlights from the day we call it happy and sad. So we do some happy memories. For every three happy memories, we share a sad memory. So we're acknowledging the hard stuff, but we're also growing the good stuff and maximizing the good stuff. And then we talk about how it feels. And what we're looking for is peace. And the absence of peace is always an opportunity to turn to God for more peace. So having peace is a good expression of who God made us to be. He's the Prince of Peace. So he gives peace freely. Um, but I find as, as a pastoral counselor, it's where we don't have peace in our lives. Those are golden opportunities to find peace so that we remain um, in our relational sweet spot so that we can still be the best version of ourselves when we interact with Emmanuel and when we interact with people. We want to be in that relational sweet spot. And peace is foundational. That's what we want to hold on to. Awesome. Well, Chris, this has been wonderful. I wish we had more time to just keep oh. going because I know we could talk for ages, but I just want to say thank you for all of you for showing up, for your questions, for your comments. It was just great to have you join us for this time. We hope that you will check out some of the resources that we mentioned. And remember that if you were encouraged by this, you can take the link where you registered and pass that along to friends and they can receive the recording of this webinar. And Chris, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your insight with us and leading us in the process to becoming more relationally healthy as we turn on our joy switch and activate our relational brain. So thank you so much. And thank you, Christy, for leading us today and, and just guiding us along. It was a huge blessing. Thank you, friends, for being here. I just may the Lord richly bless you with joy and peace as you go your way. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody.